Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, how the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade could affect voter turnout and impact the race for governor. Plus, their narrative about the Second Amendment is not true. Um, none of it is. It's about promoting gun sales. A New Mexico sportsman says it's time for his fellow gun owners to stop allowing lobbyists to distort their beliefs. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Newly published research shows 2021's record-breaking heat wave in the Southwest contributed to the historic drought conditions and vice versa. Scientists involved in the study say this proves a connection between the two types of climate incidents, something that had been largely hypothetical to this point. Now we're going to get into the specifics of that research in the second half of the show. And I'll ask our line opinion panelists about the potential consequences of a recent Supreme Court decision limiting EPA authority. In less than 15 minutes, our land executive producer, Laura Paskus, gets some perspective on another issue recently taken up by the courts, gun rights. We'll hear from an avid New Mexico sportsman and hunter who says national lobbying groups are lying and skewing the views of gun owners like him. But we begin this week's show with the Supreme Court's flashpoint decision on abortion. Now, two weeks ago, we spoke to an ACLU attorney who explained the impacts of executive action from Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. That action is meant to protect women traveling from out of state for reproductive care here in New Mexico and the doctors who treat them. Now, we're going to explore the political implications of that order and how this issue could impact the race for governor. Let's get to the line. We're happy to have the line opinion panel back with us. We have a great panel this week. First, it's attorney Sophie Martin. Welcome to Sophie, of course. It's always great to see and hear from Michael Byrd, a public health consultant and former president of the American Public Health Association. Many might not know that. And Merritt Allen from Vox Optima Public Relations. Glad to have all of you with us today. Now, now there have been some significant developments in the governor's race over the last few weeks, like new ads from Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and Republican nominee Mark Ronchetti. And a fresh look at who's leading fundraising. We'll get into all those things, but I want to start with the impact of a leading social issue right now, as you know, abortion. Unlike some states, the procedure is still legal and available in New Mexico for now. Now, with that in mind, Sophie, let me start with you. Do you think the issue will drive turnout the way Democrats are hoping? And I'm so far, I'm seeing this all over Facebook that this is the one issue that's going to turn out Democrats like crazy. Is that actually the case here? I do think actually that it will drive turnout, um, especially to the extent that the governor can make clear. Um, well, first of all, I think it's going to drive turnout in general because, mm -hmm. because our communities are very focused on political issues, on the outcomes of elections and that those outcomes have real meaning. And also, I think there's been a real turn toward, in, at least in the Democratic Party, um, a, a greater awareness amongst the electorate that local politics matter, that local decisions, um, especially with the Supreme Court and the Dobbs opinion, turning the question of abortion back to the states, local, local elections are going to be even more meaningful mm -hmm. um, in the coming years. So, so yeah, I do think it will turn out um, voters for uh, the Democrats and, and, and may also for Republicans as well. There's some polling that suggested that it might be more meaningful, more powerful for Democrats. But, but um, this is all going to hinge, I think, on the governor's um, ability and her focus on really demonstrating that the protections that she's been putting in place over the last couple of weeks for doctors, for patients, mm -hmm. for individuals coming in from other states, you know, to, to secure abortion services here, that these all ride on, at this moment, many of them on governor actions, on, on administrative actions, mm -hmm. and are not necessarily cemented in our state laws. And so you get a new governor, you could get a totally different landscape in terms of some of these protections. Good point there. Uh, Merritt, interesting a point made by Sophie, but I'm, I have to ask, I'm a little bit curious, in many ways, it's a long way from July to November, but it's short, if you know what I mean here in political terms. Can she keep this going and others just keep things going all the way to November? And in fact, does it perhaps, as Sophie mentioned, help Republicans in some way as well? Well, I think it's interesting that this um, is kind of coming to the forefront in the governor's race because as Sophie pointed out, for local elections, it's much more uh, impactful in legislative races mm. because 
the governor does not, it's not the governor who writes with a pen, uh, a single pen stroke, gov- uh, abortion shall be illegal or illegal in the state of New Mexico. That would be the legislature. Mm-hmm. And so these ads we're seeing that the governor, the next governor will have, a, uh, will have a say in abortion in New Mexico. I think that's terribly misleading mm-hmm. uh, in one of these third party attack ads. Um, it's actually the legislature. And as trends show, I don't see the legislature moving to any sort of Republican majority. Mm -hmm. So I don't think um, we're in any particular danger in New Mexico of uh, uh, abortion rights being severely diminished. Mm -hmm. I just don't see that happen. How about Mr. Ron Ketty, uh, Merritt? Is this this something he can throw over his hip, so to speak? Can he get out from under this? Because we're going to talk about this in a second. He's actually opened his, you know, mouth on this a couple of times, and now he's trying to get out from under some things. <laughs> now well, they get some attack ads. He's, good. He's very good at um, being very emphatic about the point he make, wants to make right now. Right. And the point he wants to make right now is uh, uh, some common sense limitations on procedure. Uh, uh, 15, uh, you know, no restrictions up to 15 weeks, and then medically necessary or in cases of uh, rape or incest. I think 80% of voters would go along with that. Right. Of course, you know, it's, it's a very common sense, middle of, of the road approach. Mm-hmm. In uh, New Mexico, uh, we have no restrictions uh, whatsoever. So that would be a throttling back of uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some access, but I think very significant. It would be, you know, maybe a handful of cases performed mm-hmm. each year in New Mexico. I would say less than 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't see that as a significant uh, reduction uh, reduction in access. But, you know, it's, it's to the point. He is a very persuasive uh, communicator and is able to um, uh, make very emphatic points based on the talking point he wants to get across at the moment. Mm -hmm. Michael, uh, Sophie mentioned, and I mentioned in the governor's uh, executive action on abortion rights at the top of the show, it protects women from prosecution if they come to New Mexico for reproductive care. This is clearly an issue the governor cares about, as Sophie articulated well, and this action has a practical impact. Could it have a a political one too, proof that she's committed to this issue? Does this firm her up with with the base and anybody else that's looking to vote for her? Well, I think it I I think it does for her. Mm -hmm. And and that's all part of, you know, sort of um, I think the state legislature as well as because a a year ago, Linda Lopez, the state senator uh, already was sponsoring some legislation um, to decriminalize um, the decriminalize uh, abortion mm-hmm. so that there were would not be so that providers in would not be adversely impacted by by providing uh, abortion or abortion services so i i think that um i think that's one point i think the other point is new mexico um as we all know unfortunately is 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 a poor state mm-hmm. and and so our poverty rates are high and that ha- it has implications across the board in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, and everything else. Um, and it is a mi- we are a m- minority majority state, mm-hmm. so that I think clearly weighs into because the 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 um, the abortion um, the overturn of by the Supreme Court of, of, of access and availability of, of, of to abortion uh, really significantly impacts uh, women of color. And, and, and poor women. And um, so I think that, you know, th- those communities, those populations who, and, and they've had access to it here in New Mexico. So it's, it's, it's not something you would, you can just uh, take a, once somebody has it, it's more difficult to take it away. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we'll see how this plays out in terms of the, the Supreme Court going forward. That's right. You know, Sophie, interesting, there's a bit of a Twitter war erupting over a different ad. There's the one, <laughs> where against Mr. Ron Ketty, uh says he is opposed to abortion, or is it at all stages, uh, which he's fighting back, as Merrick just uh, pointed out. But this one, Mr. Ron Ketty calls embarrassingly fake. It features a portalis nurse who says she couldn't have graduated without the Governor's Opportunity Scholarship. Um, I'll let you get into some of the details if you'd like to, but essentially there was sure. confusion over when the nurse was actually in school versus when the scholarship was first available. But the fact is she received some money, and she graduated, 
Is this something voters will notice or remember, or is this just one of those technical little blips in the road here, just groping for an ad? I frankly don't think it is something that voters will remember, uh, at least not in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, Mr. Ronchetti's supporters may continue to kind of latch onto it and use it as as um, sort of a reminder of their own motivation or something like that. But I don't think that for the most part, Democratic voters are likely to care very much about this particular um, he said, she said. Um, we do see there is a, at least one reporter who's saying, well, actually, I think that the, the details in this um, this ad are accurate, but that's mm -hmm. not going to matter right. to Ron Ketty supporters. So, you know, it, this kind of squabbling might serve at some point to um, diminish the drive for particular voters who are like on the fence to go in and vote. But mm. I, I I think so far from the election, this is just it's something to keep their names in the news, something to squabble over. Mm -hmm. I don't you know, think it's going to have a big impact. Good point there. Uh, Merritt, got to get this in. Fundraising will be a major factor this race, no doubt about it. In the latest report, Mr. Ronchetti pulled in about $450,000 more than the governor in that last reporting period. But the governor, of course, still has a major cash advantage. Uh, will Mr. Ronchetti have to make up that gap to compete in November? I mean, it's a, about a mil. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Go buy a lot of TV, the gap. But what's, what's your sense of that? I think he will. I also think he can. Um, okay. He is. He's. Uh, 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 his team is uh, highly successful at fundraising. Uh, we saw this in Susanna Martinez's two races. Um, I, I don't think money is going to be a problem uh, for Mark Ronchetti. I think the flavor of this race is going to be a race to the center, mm -hmm. uh, showing uh, that the the most uh, popular uh, issues, uh, jobs, the economy. Um, uh, taxes, all the things that New Mexicans care the most about while disparaging the other candidates. So it's going to be a, a negative slugfest, right. uh, a race to the middle. I mean, if you'd asked Mark Ronchetti how he felt about abortion in March in the height of a highly partisan primary, we would have never heard what we're uh, hearing right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, if you'd asked uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham in the Democratic primary in 2018 what she thought about uh, cutting taxes, no, she would have never gone for a tax cut as she did uh, in the uh, 22, uh, 2022 uh, legislative session. Mm -hmm. So both, uh, both candidates have moved to the center. It's going to be uh, very moderate politically on issues, but very nasty personally. Mm -hmm. Hey, Michael, in the money chase here, Mr. Ron Cuddy's big donors were farmers, ranchers, and energy executives. No big surprise there. But the governor got big donations from um, the Mexico tribal governments and a political action committee affiliated with PNM employees. Very interesting there. Did, does that say anything to you? Who's donating to who and, and why? Uh, well, for me, it's no surprise. I mean, it's it's kind of it that's how things in new mexico and, and tend to align anyway yeah in terms of you know who who do those interests represent uh both on both on both sides mm -hmm. and so it's um you know i i'm not i'm not surprised that the tribes are lining up and i'm glad tribes are more engaged mm -hmm. they have you know and have been increasingly so if if, if, if we're if we forgot got about gary johnson in indian gaming it it was mm -hmm. It's a very quick history. Please. The tribes went to Bruce King, who was the incumbent governor, Democrat, and, and asked for his support for gaming. He refused to do to act on it. So and I'm sure his assumption was, well, what are the tribes going to do? Do they're going to go support the Republican Johnson? They did. Guess right. what? He won. So I think there's growing and, and much needed in the state greater visibility and economic and political influence that tribes did not have prior to gaming. Mm -hmm. And that that's important for New Mexico because the, the population in the community that has been continues to be marginalized and by any measure historically and to this date it, are native populations. Mm -hmm. Good points there. Uh, thank you to our line opinion panelists. We'll see you all back around the virtual round table in a little over 10 minutes to talk about that new research connecting heat waves and drought. So many times Native people weren't comfortable in museums or um, they, things were presented inaccurately or kind of like in this pan-Indian voice, um, you know, not recognizing the, the vast differences between many of the different people. 
Here in New Mexico, almost 60% of homes have at least one gun. Some of those are for hunting, personal security, all different reasons. Now, in the face of America's growing gun violence, particularly against children, our land executive producer Laura Pascas sits down with one New Mexico sportsman who says gun owners need to push back against the National Rifle Association's rhetoric about the Second Amendment. Hi, Garrett. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I know you are a sportsman. We've talked many times over the years about hunting and fishing issues. I'd like to talk today about the role that guns have played in your life. Yeah, I mean, my grandfather was a big hunter and uh, I inherited his guns and my father was a World War II vet. Uh, he liberated Buchenwald and Dachau and was a very serious hunter and very passionate hunter and he passed away and I have his guns. And so I was raised in a family of guns and it was a big part of my life and, and still is in many ways a big part of my life. I'm a, still a big hunter and feed my family with elk and deer and other game meat and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's part of who I am for sure. Yeah, and you recently wrote an op-ed titled, Gun Owners Must Speak Up. Yeah. What's going on there? So, you know, I, I think um, I, I had an epiphany in that if this conversation is gonna change and we're gonna have real substantive reform that gun owners are gonna have to be the ones who are speaking up uh, in favor of gun reform. And um, I think the recent events especially were especially horrifying and troubling. And, and I, the epiphany that I had was that I, as a gun owner, was complicit in the bloodshed uh, by being silent. And I felt as though it's really my job as a community member to speak up and say, wait a minute, I own guns, but we need to really have some major changes. Guns are too easy to get. There's too many of them. And there is a mania out there of gun use and gun culture that needs to change. And the NRA, of course, is, is one of the biggest complicit uh, members of this conversation. And so much bloodshed is responsible. Uh, it's on their hands, but also Walmart, also Cabela's, also Sportsman's Warehouse, also every single gun shop. Uh, but also every single gun owner. And uh, it's important as a family member, as a community member, uh, for me to say, I'm all in on gun reform. Yeah. In that op-ed, you wrote that the National Rifle Association has done an incredible job gaslighting gun owners like me with its polished propaganda. What do you mean by that? Ever since I was a little boy, you know, my dad was an NRA member and we had the, the NRA magazines on all of our tables. And of course, I consumed that as a little boy. Uh, and their propaganda is uh, very uh, polished and, and very passionate. Their imagery is very passionate. You know, the Charlton Heston holding up the gun from my, you know, dead hands or whatever he said. So I was a, a victim of that, you know, propaganda and gaslighting as a young boy and believed, you know, the Second Amendment, uh, you know, no way, no, you know, no compromise, no give. Um, but it was all a bunch of, excuse my French, bull yeah. it really is. And it's, um, it's false. Their narrative is false. Their narrative about the Second Amendment is not true. Um, none of it is. It's about promoting gun sales, which is a multi-billion dollar industry in the U.S. And it's about shareholder money, and that's what it's about. And they use sportsmen uh, as also as their voice, and I'm not gonna be part of that. I will not be complicit in that, so. Yeah, getting ready for this interview, I was doing a little bit of research on um, just how big business um, guns are in America, and looking at uh, PBS NewsHour analysis, in 2020, U.S. gun manufacturers made 11.1 million firearms, and that's almost double what they made 10 years earlier, yeah. and it's just a small number of companies, fewer than 10 companies control the vast majority of the market for pistols and rifles. Right. Um, and in the, uh, this analysis also talked about how there's been a shift in how guns are marketed and more toward, um, you know, kind of fear-based, home security, yeah. self-defense. And they posited that um, 
that shift in marketing has been linked to a decline in recreational use. I'm curious, you know, your thoughts on that and what you've seen in New Mexico. Yeah, it makes sense. I was in Cabela's actually a couple days ago and I walked in and there was a black gun coffee company stand right in the entryway and their label is an AK on their coffee. And so that labeling and that, that uh, marketing and that imagery now is everywhere throughout uh, sporting goods stores and t-shirts and, and everything and so it's a it's a cultural icon uh, and it's it's crazy the way that it's been uh, marketed and perceived and twisted um, also like this whole you know connection to patriotism uh, you know being patriotic is being community minded right it's about taking care of issues that affect our families and our, and our homes and our communities. That's what patriotism is. It's not about me, mine, um, you know, over my dead body sort of thing. I don't know when we started thinking that way as a country, but it's really dangerous stuff. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm curious if you have a sense of or understand why as Americans, and particularly it seems like American men are so susceptible to that messaging. Well. I mean, if there was ever a, a definition of toxic masculinity, you know, the, the, the long gun with the, you know, tactical weapon with the, with the military attire, uh, it, it's about, you know, identifying and, and empowerment. These, these are symbols of empowerment. I, I, I was reading somewhere, one of the gun companies, I think it was Daniel Defense who, who produced the gun that was in the Uvalde uh, shooting. Uh, they have a man card that goes with your purchase. And so it is about masculinity, uh, identifying with masculinity. It's really interesting. Um, the most insecure men I have met are the men, I was out in uh, Malheur with the Bundy standoff. And uh, it's insecure men hiding behind these powerful tools. Um, and there's obviously lots of great gun owners, but we don't need to wear a gun on our hip to, to feel secure, right? Um, and, and they've really, the gun manufacturers and the NRA have really played off of that. And now they're doing it with women, right? They're making pink guns and, uh, you know, it's really very sophisticated marketing. Um, but I think that oftentimes insecure men are real susceptible to this because it makes them feel empowered. And um, it's, it's kind of sad, actually. Yeah, and it's such a divisive issue. So I'm curious, as a gun owner, um, you know, where do we go in terms of gun reform? What do we really need to do in, the, in this country right now? Well, we need to make it hard to buy a gun. And you know, it's interesting, a lot of the gun reform that's being proposed doesn't affect your Second Amendment rights at all. You can still bear your arms. It's just a little bit more difficult to buy that 15th gun, right? And um, I, I think that we need to make guns difficult to purchase. All guns, not just long guns, not just tactical, uh, you know, military style guns, but all guns need to be difficult to buy. And um, that, I'm okay with that, right? Like you should have to prove that you're, uh, able to handle this very dangerous tool. You have to do it with a car, you have to do it with prescription drugs, you have to do it with everything else, but why, why not guns, right? Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. And the reproductive issue is the same thing. There's, there's so many loopholes and, and stop gaps, but we don't have that for guns. And that makes no sense. There needs to be a level playing field. And so, you know, I think the, the mandatory background checks make a ton of sense. There's some quick and simple things that we can do. I think this new federal legislation, of course, it's not, uh, it's not so substantive, but it's a great start. It's, it's, a, it's a turning point. And so um, I, I would like to see a mandatory in-person gun safety class for first-time gun buyers. You have to prove that you know how to safely handle a gun. And I think that that would also vet uh, people that shouldn't own guns, mentally unstable people as well. So those are common sense things that I think, uh, and it's amazing, virtually all of my friends who own guns agree with me. I, I don't know a single gun owner 
who doesn't think this is a good idea because their families are threatened, their communities are threatened, because this could happen anywhere at any time and it happens every single day. Uh, I don't know any gun owners who don't think that common sense gun reform is a good thing. Right. So. Well, thanks for talking with me about this, Garrett. Yeah, it's a really important issue and I, again, I appeal to gun owners all out there to walk away from the NRA, talk to your congressional delegates and, and county commissioners and leadership and urge them to support all this. It's the safety of our community depends upon it. So. Right. Well, thank you. And then it comes up into modern times when um, I included Deb Halen and um, she was very gracious to donate her dress, the turquoise dress that she wore when she was sworn in to the U.S. House of Representatives. New research is amplifying the conversation around drought and climate change. A study published in the journal Geophysical Research Letters confirms drought feeds rising temperatures during heat waves, and those rising temperatures in turn feed drought. Let's bring the Line Opinion panel back in to talk through this one. These scientists say this is the first evidence of something that had been hypothetical to this point. And Michael, would this spark more focus towards climate change and climate action? I mean, it, it, it seems easy to grasp what these folks are trying to tell us here. Will that, will that land in folks' minds in, in a way that we need to make some serious change here? Um, all I can say is one would hope so. Yeah, I hear that. Um, because, you know, th this is a manifestation of something we've never seen. And, and, uh, and they pointed out the fact that the, the number of deaths in the Southwest in 2021 were significantly yes. increased. And, and it's something, again, it's something, you know, we, we've, we've seen droughts and, and they tend to, as they referenced, they tend to be slow in forming, but these flash, these flash, uh, as they've re referenced, flash droughts mm -hmm. that come on fast and are extremely uh, hotter and more deadly. There, there's, there's, uh, there's an intersection between those, you know. Well, first of all, all things are all things are connected in terms of people and the environment, and nature and temperatures. Mm -hmm. And if we think we're having issues here, uh, one needs to just look at what's go happening globally as well in terms of Africa and many other countries, even European countries, where the temperatures are rising significantly. That's right. So we're we're all we're all a part of that. We're all the 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 global the global um, environment is 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 interconnected and interrelated. So anything that happens someplace else does impact us. That's what right. we do impacts other parts. So yeah, I mean I mean it's 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 what we need to know. The question as you've referenced, are we going to be motivated to action? Are we actually going to do something? Mm -hmm. And with with the decision that the Supreme Court just made impacting EPA um, and their ability to regulate what is going on, um, you know, that 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 doesn't help this and that doesn't help mm -hmm. us. Sophie, let me ask you to pick up that point in the Supreme Court decision yeah. that surprised a lot of folks uh, moving to limit the power of of the EPA, as Michael mentioned, and other regulatory agencies. I should throw that in there, too. Th this opens the door for higher pollution rates, which contribute to climate change. What's your reaction to that ruling? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does. It, it does some very strange things mm -hmm. to our um, in, to regulations, not just the environmental arena. I mean, this this particular decision was focused on the EPA and Environmental right. Clean Water Act, et cetera, Clean Air Act. Pardon me. Um, but but you know, what does the court signal? I think that that as we read the tea leaves, it signals that there will be other um, regulatory bodies who may not who also may not have the kind of direction from Congress that the Supreme Court is now indicating it wants mm -hmm. um, to do their jobs and, and, you know, other agencies that we really rely on. One of the things that's tough right now, and I think this reflects the sort of, I'd say, the big C conservatism of the current court, is that in our current legislative, you know, with our, our essentially deadlock more or less in the Senate, um, with the filibuster, et cetera, U.S. Senate, um, the ability of Congress to come back and say, yeah, by 
enacting these pieces of legislation by saying, EPA, we want you to do these things, other regulatory agencies, we want you to do these things. We mean, we want explicitly, right, the things that the court has, has called into question. In a deadlock situation like we see right now in Congress, can those changes be made? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. it. It certainly could be very difficult, despite the fact that that these acts typically, you know, come with bipartisan support historically. That's not the case today. And so so what the, the court has essentially put in place is you have to make these changes in a context in which we may not be able to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Interesting point there, and Merritt, I'll, I'll remind this sort of hitched, not sort of, it hitched around the agency's ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So yeah. think about it from what Sophie just said, it, you know, if the Congress <laughs> is gonna have to green light whether these folks can actually issue caps or not, that's gonna be a difficulty, it would seem to me, because legal analysts have been pouring over the controversial decision from the court you know, regardless of political or social ideology, it's clear the conservative majority is putting the onus on Congress to find legislative solutions to these issues. Do you agree with that stance? Just right there, that first things first? Well, I, I think politicizing science is always a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really would encourage um, climate deniers in my party to take the emotion out of it and just look at it from a very realistic and pragmatic point of view. The climate on this planet has always been changing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there have been ice ages, there have been warming trends, there have been great droughts in the Southwest. I mean, uh, some of the larger uh, cult previous cultures collapsed because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Climate change is a real scientific proven thing. That's right. And then if you look at the environment today, where we, uh, the war in Ukraine is really upsetting, upsetting global grain markets. The Russians are stealing Ukrainian grain mm -hmm. and smuggle, smuggling it out, selling it to uh, Syria. That puts our farmers, that puts US farmers at great risk, trying to figure out how much to plant, what to plant. They bought it at higher prices because they thought they were gonna be able to sell it at higher prices. Well, if you know, the Russians dump a lot of grain. These are all pragmatic pragmatic, realistic business situations, then if we have a catastrophic weather event because of climate change, which is a real scientific thing, mm -hmm. we have a problem. So, you know, take your knee jerk emotional reaction out of it and look at it pragmatically. Mm -hmm. This is what we this is what we need to do. And so to expect Congress to do anything, I mean, just look at the, for five decades trying to get something done about immigration. That's not going to happen. Good point. So are they going to do something about environmental regulation? I think not. They need to do act quickly on cybersecurity. That ain't going to happen. So no, I think that was, um, uh, again, judicial activism that uh, we really certainly did not need at this point in time. Yep. Michael, I want to circle back to something that Sophie mentioned, because when you really think about it, you know, the changing role of all the regulatory agencies as a whole in this country are kind of be up against it here because if you're going to have to go find three or four or five friendlies in Congress to lobby for you, what, what are you as a regulatory agency at that point? You're supposed to be outside of that whole mess. You're not supposed to be lobbying Congress people to, because to, that's what it's going to come down to when you really think about it. A lot of backroom dealing, a lot of backroom conversations. Am I off on this? I mean, I, I can't see it going any other way. Well, one of the other agencies that's referenced in, mm -hmm. in, in this action is CDC. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I uh oh, mean, right. We're, <laughs> we're not we're not done with COVID. People may not be wearing their masks, and some and as as somebody who is a public health professional and just coming off of some seven weeks uh, uh, with a new with an experience with the new COVID variant, let me tell you. I mean, I didn't have to go to the hospital, but um, I wouldn't want anybody I know to ever have to go through that experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you hamstring these agencies that, that were established, have been established, longstanding history of, 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 of protecting and, and responding to emergencies of, of, of various kinds. And, and, and now we're going to have, you know, now we're looking at the Supreme Court to, to provide guidance, or we're looking at the national legislature, you know, the Congress, I think, you know, <laughs> we're kind of in a di downward spiral if, we're, if, if we don't 
allow those agencies that were established to protect us all to function. Mm -hmm. Why are we muddying the separation of powers? Thank you. And why does this court not sort of follow its own kind of established ideology, which is what was the intention at the time of the legislation? That's right. I mean, that's the conservative, that's the historical conservative stance. And if the intent at the time of the legislation was that this was enough, then why is it not still enough? That's a good point there. So for oh, we've got the big questions happening. That's right. Hey, Sophie, real quick, just I, I, I got to get this in. We know New Mexico, yeah. other southwest states are disproportionately feeling impacts of climate change. W where do we fit into this conversation on the national scale? Are we going to have to get together with Texas, Arizona, Nevada, and put on some kind of front here? Hey, let me throw California into that list. Of course. Because California mm -hmm. has so much market power. And I think, I think what we're going to be looking at, at least in the near term, and the near term is probably pretty long, mm -hmm. is um, state and local action to try to combat uh, climate change and take care of these other issues. And California, as we know, is the 800-pound gorilla there. New Mexico is fortunate that I would say that our environmental goals very much are in alignment with California's. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we're a small state with relatively little power. Um, you know, it, legislatively in the in the Congress, but um, working with uh, the other states that share our goals and our interests, mm -hmm. um, I think can can lend us a larger voice. You can you can feel it happening already. Merritt knows about this well. You know, there are folks in the business of coalescing people together to make groups and associations to put a united front on. You can see a whole new wave of that coming when it comes to this with this decision. It's going to be very difficult. Thank you to our Line Opinion panel once again. We'll be back in less than 10 minutes to talk about a new ballot initiative that would take money from the land grant permanent fund invested in education. But first, a look inside the newly redesigned exhibit at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. It's called Here, Now, and Always, and highlights indigenous people of the Southwest, showcasing never-before-seen items and state-of-the-art technology, but it also sets the standard for collaborations with the Native American community. The Mexico in Focus correspondent Antonia Gonzalez got a sneak peek before it opened to the public this month. Here now and always. This is an exhibit that using um, Native co-curation and many consultants to give voice to the Native people of the Southwest through their uh, words and the uh, material culture that their communities produce for that visitors to see and experience these vast and different and long lived cultures in this region. So when visitors come to the exhibition, they'll be they'll come through the emergence tunnel, which is a transitory space, so that people, you know, as many uh, cultures in the Southwest, their origin stories talk about the beginnings, you know, from another earth and emerging onto this earth. This bronze sculpture by Roxanne Swensel that she created uh, at the earlier Here Now and Always that we wanted to keep the earth mother, clay mother, um, creating her people and then telling them to go forth. And so they're forth and she's pointing towards the entrance of the exhibition. And then they come out into the Cycles Hub. And then from that Cycles Hub, it's very it's circular and it's kind of broken up into the different themes of cycles. They can choose a direction they want to go through the, out the exhibit. So it's not just a maze, uh, but it's basically they can choose their own path. And why is it important that museums collaborate directly with indigenous people, especially if they're going to share information about indigenous communities? The best people to interpret a culture are usually the people from that culture themselves. They know the ins and outs. They know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to discuss. Um, in the past, that's always been an issue with museums. So many times, Native people weren't comfortable in museums or um, they, things were presented inaccurately or kind of like in this pan-Indian voice, um, you know, not recognizing the, the vast differences between many of the different people. Even just in our, you know, the, our corner of the country in the Southwest, the communities can be very different. So it's important to get that voice, that community voice, then so that they can present things that they want people to know and to let, you know, what they want the world to know about them. And to go along with that, why should museums, um, art spaces, present people as living cultures, living here now in this, you know, today's world instead of people of the past. A lot of times we see history books, museums, talking about Native Americans as in the past. It's very true. It's been really important for Native people to be presented in the here and now because 
and you know, often you know, in the popular culture, Native people are seen as how they were, you know, in 1880 or so, and you know, it's that's well over a century now, and it's what we want to present is both that past but also the present and hopefully the future so that people can see that Native people in this region have a very long history here, you know, going back before any European and, you know, and before people are even recording histories and that it continues to this present day that people are still living, working and creating now. There's a dance group of Zuni Oyemenon, so it's not just one, but we only could put one in here. There's up to 11 of them, I think, and they sing and they dance, and they're, they're really joyful, and they've been practically around the world. They've been here in, at the museum a couple of times. Um, the jewelry was consigned out to jewelers at uh, Zuni, and there's rings, there's pins, there's bracelets, there's earrings, and Mrs. Juanita Adaki made most of the outfit and painted the pot. This was quite um, an event for me to put this together because it took us about two and a half days before we could really get her um, straight. And it took about three or four people, if not more, um, to stand her, to dress her. And I think now the people in exhibits have learned to dress a Pueblo mannequin. That we are nations, not just Pueblos or tribes, that we are nations, that we're self-governing. And then it comes up into modern times when um, I included Deb Halen, and um, she was very gracious to donate her dress, the turquoise dress that she wore when she was sworn in to the U.S. House of Representatives as a representative from New Mexico, District 1. And then now she's um, Secretary of the Interior. She signifies um, sovereignty, not just to people of the Southwest, but to all Native people in the United States and in the hemisphere. And as a woman, being a woman helping curate and also just featuring Native women in this exhibit, not only in what you did here, but all throughout the exhibit, why is that important? I think it's important because it shows women of all the tribes and all the work that we do, and it's recognized here. So I want it to recognize both from young people like Marla Almason, who's like to me in her 20s, and then like to Zuni Oya Maiden. And the first Zuni Oya Maiden came and she's like a grandma, a great grandma, and this lady's uh, a grandmother and they're teachers. To me, that's the important is because the women are the teachers in the community, most of the communities. It's up to the women to relay home, community, and support and just keep the family going. This one is by Lauren Aragon from uh, Acoma Pueblo. He actually was, he won a design award at the Phoenix Fashion Week a couple of years ago. And he came into the museum and we had already thought about asking him to create a piece for us because we wanted to get more you know, couture and the, and the collections. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if he took inspiration from a piece in collections? So he went through and looked uh, at the Acoma pieces and he selected this jar. So he's looked at this jar and this is his inspiration I'm address from that jar. One, I wanted not to show the standard pieces that kind of sometimes that people expect, you know, those from like, you know, the major artists and such too. I also wanted to acknowledge those things that um, uh, like the grandmothers make at their kitchen tables as well. That the things they also, they made for their communities, but also for to sell because they saw that as supporting their families and continuing the culture as well. And to teach their children how to do it. Um, and my grandmother taught all of her children how to pot, um, both boys and girls, because she said, one day you might need to make a living at this. And, but also at the same time, it was to continue that tradition of honoring and um, working with Mother Earth as well. So there's these two things that join. And so I wanted to do that, but also wanted to choose things that came from many different areas. That since I'm from a Pueblo, I just didn't want to, to have just only Pueblo things, but to really showcase all of the tribes, not only in New Mexico, but in the greater Southwest. And I believe we have something from almost every, um, currently recognized 20 Pueblos, including Isleta del Sur in Texas, and also from many different communities, both um, uh, Navajo and Apache, the different groups, uh, Hickory, uh, Apache, Muscalero, San Carlos, and, uh, but also the Dono Otam and Paiute as well. 
Um, so, as, and you know, our, our Hopi uh, neighbors in Arizona. So that that there's that when people come here, hopefully they'll be able to see at least you know something from their com community or region, and that they'll also feel part of this huge experience. We wanted visitors to leave here happy to know that you know we were our survivors and that we're not downtrodden or impoverished or anything like that, but that we're happy and that we convey not just to our own Pueblo, but to everybody in New Mexico and everybody in the world. A new initiative on the ballot in November would increase the amount of money from the land grant permanent fund that goes to education. Welcome back to our line opinion panel. The initiative would increase its permanent fund distribution by 1.25% with that money going toward early childhood ed education and an increase of funding for K through 12 schools. We have the money, let's just start there. Wait, Sophie, is this an area to take advantage? You know, I'm having the sense of deja vu. I feel like we talked about this a couple of months ago on this show and, mm -hmm. I, and I do still think, you know, given where our school systems are, educational programs are nationwide and what we know on a local level about the education that our kids are receiving. And of course this is, no smack against teachers mm -hmm. um, that that seems clear to me that more funding is needed and in particular more funding that is directed toward the communities that participate in the Yazi Martinez um, Supreme Court case you mm -hmm. know that this this is part of our state's obligation to uh, tribal communities and others so I, I it seems to me my hope is that the that the electorate will say yes to this one mm -hmm. hey Michael I want to read some of the specific language from the initiative um, which states the extra money would go towards quote enhanced instruction for students at risk of failure extending the school year teacher compensation and early childhood education um, but we're talking about at least 125 million in pre-K and up to 75 million in K through 12 programs each year. That's a lot of money. And you know, how do you, again, we're going to the voters on this. Is this something the voters would support in your early take on this? Well, I don't know if the voters will support it or not. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's important that it, that I'm, I'm glad it's being proposed. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, and of course, accountability, I think, isn't, is, is, would be one of my concerns. But I, I guess the, the thing I would say is that um, um, the populations that, that would be impacted and are, are referenced in terms of the, the, the Yazi Martinez case. Um, and when you look, when, and, and this is based on my, my lived experience here in New Mexico and, and everything that I have done in terms of public health and and New Mexico, in terms of poverty rates, you know, in, in terms of all the negative measures, social economic measures in New Mexico, Indians consistently come out at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's no accident. I mean, it, 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 it's not just it's not because we're inferior genetically. It's not because we're lazy. It's not because we we're not committed because you see you see those of us who've had who who've been provided the opportunity and sees the opportunity can compete. Um, and, 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 there, and racism still is a very real thing here in New Mexico, as well as the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, I, I won't go into that, but um, so, you know, if you really, and, and the fact of the matter, New Mexico's, <laughs> I, I will say this, New Mexico's economy historically has been predicated on Indians. And native art, culture, archaeology, right. history, and 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 so much of new and people don't realize that they don't see that because they're not connected to it and they don't know the history of this mm -hmm. of New Mexico. But if they did, I think many people would have more of a sense of a, and a sense of appreciation of that, of what native people have contributed in terms of land, art, culture, archaeology, history. The base for New Mexico, significant part of the base of New Mexico, which also is related to the economy, has to do with Native people. Mm -hmm. Have Native people benefited? It, it's hard to see it, in my, for, it from my lens, in yep. my, from my view. Yep. And unless we begin to invest in, in Native children and in Native programming, um, nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me ask you this. That's an ex excellent, excellent 
point to add, so I can get to this question. The All Pueblo Council of Governors, as you know, supports the plan. The, and the group says it has a specific strategy for the money if it's approved. And it would be potentially a much more efficient way that mentioned what Sophie mentioned to address the Yazi Martinez lawsuit because the group says its goal is to direct funds to tribal education departments they say can reform local schools efficiently. That sounds pretty good, actually. Um, I, I'm interested in well, your thoughts on can, that. It can happen. Mm -hmm. I, I was part of, for my own tribe, helped create the Kiwa Pueblo Health Center uh, for Santa Domingo Pueblo a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. We were getting federal funding from I services through IHS. We went 638 self and took over the facility, expanded on the facility, expanded revenue, expanded services, and, and totally changed the, the nature and quality of services that were available to Kiwa Pueblo as well as surrounding Pueblos because it's a major health center located on the reservation. Mm -hmm. And when you see what IHS was providing, and what's not being provided now, it's it's altered and changed um, the quality and nature of healthcare being available to Kiwa Pueblo as, other, as well as other Pueblos. And other tribes have exercised that under Public Law 93-638, Indian Self-Determination. This seems to me to be a, sort of a version of that mm -hmm. so that the tribes now can, can do things in the way that they choose to, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to go to the federal government, as opposed to having programs that go through the state. Much of the CDC funding, I don't know if it's still the case now, but in the past, much of the native populations would be part of the the population that would, would that the state would go forward for federal fundings to CDC and other agencies. We would be counted. But when those funds came to the state, it very little or nothing ever got to the tribes. That's a good point. Yep, exactly right there. Mm -hmm. uh, Merritt, interesting, we've been waiting on action as we're talking about this uh, on the Yazi Martini lawsuit for years now. And now, if you think about it, a potential solution is in the hands of the voters. Is that the proper avenue for this? Or should the no. legislature step up and take action on this? Uh, this is absolutely not the way to, the way to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. The legislature should step up. PED should step up. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, a way to pass the buck uh, to the voters with money uh, that comes from someplace else. Uh, first of all, the majority of this goes to early childhood. We have an early childhood investment fund already that's making more money than anybody ever thought was going to happen. That's a lot of money. What happened to that? That's right. Um, and I, I would go to uh, Michael's point about accountability. Um, there's not enough in the ballot initiative to really put any teeth in it where it's going to go. If it's allocated by school district, APS is going to get most of it. APS has shown it can't deliver a budget that can pass board scrutiny, much less granularity public would accept in a vote, voter initiative. I think it's, uh, I think the goals are absolutely appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think um, the mechanism is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, you heard earlier, Merritt, you know, I mentioned the four little bullet points that the administration wants to address. But I have to say, again, we're talking about uh, 200 million a year. I mean, which is great. Don't get me wrong here. This is really quite wonderful. How does one spend that amount of money? That is a tremendous amount of money. What happens to teachers? In an accountable way. And mm -hmm. where has PED been this whole time? Where's the legislature been yeah. this whole time? Um, I, I just, uh, I think this is uh, passing the buck in a way without putting a lot of thought into it mm -hmm. and just finding a new pot of money and putting it on the voters to come up with it. I, I don't like this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Sophie, the previously mentioned PED, State Public Education Department, released its draft plan, as you know, to address the Yazzie Martini lawsuit earlier this year. But public comments kind of slipped by. They ended June 17th. Does this ballot initiative change that plan at all in your view? I think it. I think it remains to be seen. I mean, okay. uh, you know, there was some commentary at the time that maybe the PED plan didn't go far enough, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, will they view this as an opportunity for sort of a multiplicative effect, or, or, you know, it, I think it's just going to depend on the outcomes. And and let's face it, this path through um, the ballot initiative is not a short one. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so um, the, I we'll mean, the goals here, I, I got to throw this in, Sophie, the goal, a 15% increase in graduation rates and increased reading and math proficiency by 50% for the groups identified in the lawsuit by 2025. And goals are important, 
But a lot really of education fast, advocates. Though, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Really but you gotta fast. Have something. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's important to have goals, but I think it is it is equally important to have goals that are um, achievable within your grasp. And right. that that fifty percent in particular, woo, that is a fast timeline for that. Mm-hmm. Now, I am not an educator. I'm not working in in that particular arena. I'm not mm-hmm. an expert in that arena. But but from outside, given the, the timeline, that feels really quick to me. We'll have to see where Merit's point stands on this too. A lot of folks are not crazy about ballot initiatives for big money, so we'll see what happens here. This could be very interesting. Thanks again to our line panel as always. This week, be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. One of the lingering habits from the pandemic shutdown for me is YouTube in particularly following YouTubers who crawl the desert southwest. I love them. Ghost towns, old mining operations, all that glorious detritus that comes with it. It's so much fun to watch. The latest versions have been YouTubers reporting on the dropping water levels at the bigger reservoirs in the region. Most recently, the situation out at Lake Mead on the Nevada-Arizona border. And notably, that dead body found in the 55-gallon drum. I'm sure you caught the news on that. But what these YouTubers reveal from ground zero with cell phones and GoPros is far more shocking than what the news channels have shown. Look, a 170 foot water level drop will get your attention and that's what's happened at Lake Mead. As you might imagine, our own Elephant Butte is in the mix with a 90 foot drop from its high water mark. The impact on recreation and commerce is well reported by these YouTubers, as is the impact on our farms, which has been well reported by my colleague, Laura Pascas for our land. But what really gets me watching these intrepid YouTubers are how the little encampments and things from years ago that they visit will almost always be near a small trickling spring. Now it's a reminder that no matter how small the mercury claim or any other enterprise from back in the day, if there wasn't fresh water nearby, your claim likely wasn't happening. Access to water, you know, it's truly the story of the West. Now we have more science behind water management these days and thank goodness for that, but some things truly don't change. Thanks again for joining us, for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.